to our hearts today will be pleasing to God, who is our rock and our redeemer. What a name. Did you imagine growing up with a name like Dorcas? I mean, think about the times on the playground. Right? The captains are choosing teams against the end. Uh, who gets Dorcas? I don't want her. You take her. No, you take her. Think about junior high when she had her eye on that certain special boy. And he was just a little shy. So maybe he was a little intimidated. He didn't want to be known as the dork to her Dorcas. So, I mean, could you imagine growing up with a name like Dorcas? Sometimes we can be really cruel to each other, can't we? But Dorcas, obviously, in biblical times, did not have the same connotation as it does today. In fact, both Tabitha in Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, excuse me, and Dorcas in Greek mean gazelle. Gazelle is that deer-like creature with the long horns, the long pointy horns. And so actually, Dorcas has the connotation of kind of a grace or beauty of, of a deer bounding through a field. And so it would kind of have this idea of grace or beauty. But even though to us it sounds like a dork. In any case, I think it's true to say that oftentimes we don't value one another as we should. Our passage today has an important lesson to teach us about the value of each and every person. In the Bible passage today, Dorcas has died. The Apostle Peter's presence in the neighborhood village has become widely known because he has healed a man named Aeneas who had been crippled for eight years. And so news spread that Peter was here and that this healing had taken place in his hands. So the people at Joppa sent for Peter and said, Come! We need you to do something for Dorcas. We need you to bring her back to life. But the question I want to ask is why? Why did they send for Peter? People are dying every day in the city of Joppa. People are dying every day in the country of Israel. So why is this woman special? Why did the people of Joppa say, Peter, come and resurrect this woman. Bring her back to life. What makes her stand out above and against all the other people? of Java. Did you pick up on it in the text? The text tells us that she devoted herself to good works and to charity. And when Peter arrived, all the poorest of the poor came out. The widows came out to show him the garments that Dorcas had made for them and given to them. They were weeping as he was walking towards the house. They were weeping as he entered the house and they were holding up these clothing, these, these articles of clothing, shirts, pants, Socks, underwear, things that people needed. I said, look, she did this. Peter, help her. See, this is the kind of person, this is the kind of life that is valuable to God here on earth. This is the sort of person that God might want to keep around a while here on earth. You see, she's drawing other people to him. By her charitable deeds, she is directing others toward God. So Peter's resurrection of Dorcas, by the power of Jesus Christ, will honor God, and honor him doubly so. First, it will honor God by showing people the power of God. God is able to bring her back to life. He has the power to bring her back to life. It will show them that God not only truly exists, but that he uh, participates in our world and sometimes in miraculous ways. But not only will the resurrection honor God in that way, but by returning Marcus to Joppa, this woman who has devoted herself tirelessly to promoting the charitable love of God will honor him by her very life itself. So both her resurrection and her life will honor God. Are our lives in such a state that God would want to resurrect us if we die? Are we living lives in such a way that would make God want to keep us around here for a while to honor Him? A lot of people pray for healing, but they often pray for healing for the sake of being made well. But not very many of the people who pray for healing take the time to examine their lives and ask the question, why would God want to heal me? Why should God want to heal me? Am I living such, in such a way 
that I'm drawing other people to Him? Am I honoring God with my life? If we're truly Christians, our first and foremost, our most powerful desire should be to honor God. Even more than life itself, we should yearn to honor our Creator and our Savior. And if honoring God means death, then we should long for death. If honoring God means sickness, we should embrace that sickness. Charles Stanley, many of you know him, he's a very famous radio preacher, well respected in the evangelical circles, tells a story after, after suffering an illness, a long and difficult illness, he said, he came back to the pulpit and he said, while I was in the hospital, many of my people from the church, many of the people from the church that I pastor at, came to the hospital to visit me. And many times they would pray with me and they would pray for healing. But Charles realized that God didn't want <coughs> healing for him. Charles Stanley realized that God was using that time of illness and suffering to draw him closer to God. And he said that suffering, that illness, that time in the hospital, that time of recovery, became for him one of the most intimate times he had ever experienced throughout his entire lifetime in his relationship with God. In life or death, comfort or illness, honoring God is our highest call. Now someone may point out that not everybody in the Bible or not everybody in our life who is healed is leading a life that honors God. They say, say well, that's not why Dorcas was healed. They say, they say that that doesn't matter. That, that living a life that honors God, God loves all life and he wants to heal all life. But notice, in each of these cases where a person was healed, think about the ten lepers and one returned to thank Christ. Uh, think about the people who didn't know Christ before or after. In each of these cases, when a healing occurred, the healing itself, not the life, but the healing itself was the thing that honored God. Once again, bringing us back to our original premise, which is the highest goal in our lives should be to honor God. When we live a life that honors God, our lives have value both in this world and the next. But someone may argue, well, Daniel, life itself has value. They would say that life is a valuable thing to God. And this would be partially true. See, all life does have value, but not because of life. All life has value in one way or another because all people will eventually honor God. All people will honor God one day. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah foretells of a time when, quote, every knee will bow and every tongue will give glory to God. This prophecy is quoted by Paul in his letter to the Romans and explained in his letter to the Philippians in which he says, there will come a day, that's judgment day, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess, you know the rest of it? That Jesus Christ is Lord. What's he saying? On judgment day, everyone will honor God. Some people will do it reluctantly because they never did it in this life. They never trained themselves in this life to do it. Others will do it joyfully because they have spent the last 10, 20, 30, 50, 90 years honoring God. This life is a training ground for the next. Those who honor God joyfully now will do so then. Those who refuse or resist honoring God now will be forced to their knees. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess, whether they want to or not. See, we don't get a choice as to whether or not we will honor God. We only get to choose how we will do it. We choose that in this life by our actions here and over the course of our lifetime, whether or not we will honor God with joy. If we don't live lives intentionally for God's glory, then we have chosen to not honor Him. See, now is the time to change. Putting off to later could make us eternally regretful. Because those who refuse to go to their knees on Judgment Day will have their knees broken. You know, that's, a, that's a scary image, and that's a powerful and a painful image. 